Hey there, everyone. Happy New Year. I hope you've all had a safe and pleasant holiday vacation. We're going to shift our focus to a new concept, the conservation of mechanical energy. Let's see how we can apply it in today's problem. The first thing on our to-do list is to create a free body diagram of these objects. Each one will experience the force of their own weight pointing straight downwards. The box, however, will experience an additional downward force in part A due to the bag of gravel resting on top of it. We'll call that the normal force due to the gravel, like this. There are also normal forces that point in the plus y direction too. One comes from the box supporting the gravel, and another from the roof of the building supporting the two objects that are stacked on top of one another. The cable connecting the box and the bucket will exert a tension force on both objects, acting to the right on the box and upwards on the bucket. Lastly, we have frictional forces to account for. If the box moves to the right, then the friction on the box will point in the minus x direction. For the friction acting on the gravel, we have the opposite situation going on. Newton's third law demands that it would act equally in the opposite direction. Similar to what we saw in problem number 16 from chapter 5. The issue is that we have no idea whether we're dealing with kinetic friction or static friction in this part. Part B says that the system starts from rest once a worker removes the gravel, but that doesn't mean that we can automatically assume that the objects are stationary in part A. Maybe they're not. So the question is, does the system accelerate? Here's how we can figure it out. Let's calculate the maximum static friction that the roof of the building can exert on the box. Since the gravel is stacked on top of the box, we'll have to include its mass in this calculation. We know all of these numbers, so once you punch them into a calculator, you should get the following value. There's no need to worry about significant figures yet, since we're not using this to answer part A. Back on the free body diagram, we saw that the tension was responsible for opposing the friction of the box, which comes from the weight of the bucket. Let's go ahead and calculate that next. With that value known, we now have everything we need to answer the question. The tension of the cable coming from the weight of the bucket is smaller than the maximum static friction that can act on the box. So there's no way anything can be moving in part A. That means we only need to calculate the current static friction acting on the box and gravel to answer this portion. We can figure that out by doing a sum of forces on each object, starting with the gravel. Since there's no acceleration, the sum of forces in the x direction has to be equal to zero. That gives us one half of the answer for part A immediately. In the y direction, the normal force from the box and the weight of the gravel will balance each other out. Go ahead and equate those quantities if you like, but there's nothing we really need to do with that information. So let's move on to the box. In the x direction, the tension and the static friction acting on the box balance each other as well, which allows us to equate them. The sum in the y direction contains three terms, but they don't have any influence on the static friction of the box, at least in terms of us wanting to solve for that quantity. So let's go ahead and pass on these as well and move on. The bucket only moves vertically, so nothing happens in the x direction. 
in the y direction, the tension and the weight will balance due to that lack of acceleration. Now we can solve the rest of part A. If the tension is equal to the static friction on the box, and it's also equal to the weight of the bucket, then that means that the current static friction on the box is just equal to the weight of the bucket. Plug in the numbers, multiply, and part A is done. It's 637 newtons. In part B, the bag of gravel gets removed and here's where the new conservation of energy technique comes in. It says that the sum of the initial kinetic and potential energies plus any other work done on the system is equal to the sum of the final kinetic and potential energies. This is a very powerful tool here because it allows us to avoid dealing with vectors. In previous problems, we'd have to break the situation down into X and Y components, solve for some quantity in one direction and use it in the other and so on. That takes a while to do. Energy, on the other hand, is a scalar quantity. There's no need to worry about directions or anything like that. All we need to do is to be sure that we're using the correct quantities and use algebra to solve for what we need. Speaking of correct quantities, we'll need to be careful about applying this concept to a system with multiple objects in it. Each individual object will have a specific kinetic and potential energy, so let's apply this technique to both items. We get a very long equation here, but some of the values are actually zero, and we can just throw them away. For example, we were told that both of these objects start from rest here in part B. That means that the initial kinetic energy for the box and the bucket has to be zero. Additionally, the potential energy of the box can be eliminated as well. Its height doesn't change, which means that the potential energy is the same in the beginning as well as the end. Those values will end up subtracting out on both sides once we start doing the algebra, so we can just trash those right away. There's one more quantity that we can eliminate, but things are getting a little messy with elimination marks all over. Here's what the resulting expression looks like with everything cleaned up a bit. Let's plug in the definition of these so we're all on the same page before we cancel anything else out. Now, normally you might see potential energy written as like MGY or something like that. Here I'm using a D variable instead of Y to represent the distance that the bucket and the box will move. It's a vertical distance for the bucket, but it's horizontal for the box. It's the same distance for both objects, so instead of using multiple variables to represent that, we can just use one, call it D. Let's explore each of these quantities here. On the left, we have the potential energy from the bucket coming from its position, which is two meters above the spot where we want to calculate its falling speed, and the other work done on the system comes from the kinetic friction acting on the box as it moves in the plus x direction. And that steals some of the energy. On the right is the sum of the box and the bucket's kinetic energies, as well as the bucket's final potential energy. Now I mentioned before that there was one more quantity that we could eliminate. We only care about the speed of the bucket after it falls two meters. That means we can set the initial height distance, this one here, to that two meter value, and we can set the final height distance, this one here, equal to zero, which will get rid of the whole term. That will leave us 
with this expression as a result. Now, there's something that I want to point out that you may have noticed as we went along. Regarding these final velocity variables, I never put a subscript label for the box and the bucket on those, which would mean that they're the same value. Is that true? How did I know that? Let's bring a reminder from our constant acceleration kinematics into the picture. We used the following equation quite a few times. In the context of this problem, there is no initial velocity since everything started from rest, so we can cancel that out. Now, since the box and the bucket are tied together by a taut cable, the acceleration has to be the same for both. They're also being displaced by the same distance d, which is 2 meters. Therefore, this equation here tells us that the box and the bucket indeed have the same final velocity. Let's go ahead and factor this squared final velocity out from the right-hand side. There's a one-half on both masses in the parentheses here, so that can be pulled outside as well. Let's do ourselves a small favor to save on some writing, too. We can call the sum of the masses of the box and the bucket the total mass of both, like this. Next, I'll exchange the force of kinetic friction here with its definition, which is mu sub k times the normal force acting on the box without the gravel on it. And that's just the box's weight, expressed as mg. The acceleration due to gravity, g, and the 2 meter displacement of both objects, d, appear in both terms on the left-hand side. Let's get those factored out. We can now multiply both sides by 2 and divide both sides by the total mass to get the square of the final velocity isolated on the right. Now if we take the square root of both sides, we're free to plug in the numbers. And when we do that and approximate the answer to three significant figures, we get a final speed of about 2.99 meters per second. And that's it for part B. The problem is now done. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care.